so um, hi everyone, I'm Catherine and um, I'm here to talk about convergent experiences. And what I mean by that is um, just with software ubiquity and the way we design systems, we have huge tasks as UXs in software. Um, and I'm here specifically to talk about why UX approaches to designing web systems are super duper important, but we could really apply these principles to any end client experience. So I'm a bit of an agilist. Um, I don't know if you've ever sort of heard me talk about anything before, but um, I'm super sort of converted to the agile behavior as a designer. And um, I've just included a quote here from the Agile Principles, which is um, continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. And one of the points of my presentation today is about how we work cross-functionally to create great design systems and in the end, great software. So I could call myself an Agile UX coach. Um, I have been a practice lead. Um, I've managed people, I've worked in different technologies, including virtual reality, augmented reality, mobile and web. I've been a front-end developer until about four years ago, I actually developed and committed code in GitHub. So now I focus on research. I'm a research candidate at RMIT and I'm doing a thesis on user experience design and gender. So here's a great quote from Jacob Nielsen. And Jacob says that users spend most of their time on other sites. So when you're thinking about your website experience, you should really consider all the other website experiences that, that are like yours, because that's super important too. Um, and this is in an article that's on the NN Group website called um, J Jacob Nielsen's Law of Internet User Experience. It's a little bit old, but I definitely urge you to read it. Um, it's really important to understand that learnability and activity-based learning is a big part of user experience design. And when you're building new components or patterns or flows, um, if you build something new, people have to learn it and there is a learning curve involved. So when we think about systems, we can go back in time to mobile first development and atomic design. So that's going back almost six or seven years now. Um, and some of you who've been working in the industry long enough may know Luke Rubluski's book, Mobile First, which talked about designing for mobile experiences and mobile device ubiquity. There was also atomic design, and that's still frequently used, and that's bread frost. By the way, Luke Rubluski is a product director at Google, and he still specialises in the Internet of Things and mobile experiences, so he's still hugely important in the field. Um, for those of you who don't know atomic design, um, atomic design was about creating systems for web, but it could also be applied to other kinds of interfaces too, and it's how to compartmentalise and create use reusable components and patterns and systems in your design, the software. So I've worked in about five teams now who followed this protocol, and it's been effective in different ways. Luke talks about building mobile first from the team perspective. So thinking about this and context aware applications, he's really talking about the user experience. So this resonates, this was a, a quote from 2009 and it's still persistently accurate, um, talking about capabilities and the fact that users still need to learn stuff. And whatever we build, um, we need to think about the user experience and mitigating lower efficiency in their task completion, for example. Here's a recent photo of different users that I just grabbed off Google image search. It's a really nice one though, because it shows um, portable devices. So we do have laptops here, which are larger screen sizes, but they look awkward, obviously. Um, they're a bit more difficult to hold. They're not as usable in terms of the functionality, um, but they still work. And if you're sitting down, they increase in functionality and usability. We also have tablets and mobiles. So thinking about the changes and trends in 2013 to 2014, we exceeded mobile users um, globally and desktop started declining. But now we have um, some representation across every single platform. So we do have exclusive desktop use still, and that's about a quarter of global users. Um, we also have multi-platform experiences, which are two thirds of global users approximately. And we have some mobile only experiences. And I don't have enough demographic data to give you the detail of this table. But if you do go to the Com School website, I'm sure you could find some more information. So it's no longer an issue around device context, it's really around web or native. 
Um, when we talk about the web or the internet, it's internet versus native experience, and the native app experience is still a portal to the internet, so it can still be a framed internet experience within a native app. So in 2017, this year, Luke Rybluski, who still publishes to his blog, talked about these trends um, as his role, uh, as part of his role at Google. And he has a really interesting annotation here where he talks about how much of his time is actually spent within embedded web browsers. And this is in relation to average monthly minutes per user on mobile devices. So you can see it's really high, 186.9 minutes compared to the mobile web exclusively, which is 11.9. And then at Google I.O., we also have a um, set of data that was presented around mobile web reach. So obviously the mobile web is still hugely important. It's three times, hi Rowan, <laughs> um, it's three times higher than, um, than native apps. But then the time on native apps far exceeds that, as we saw on the previous slide. So along with IoT, Designers and engineers need to think more about native apps and the way they behave like the web, and also think about the fact that website apps behave like they're native. So how do we actually consider that holistically when we're creating pattern libraries and systems, especially when we're designing for web technologies and creating living style guides that are only represented in web technologies and not in native app, con app contexts? Um, and how do we think about the fact that we're trying to lower friction for the user as well in creating these experiences and consistency between omnichannel experiences, as well as increasing visitors' engagement and conversion. And this is what companies like Google are considering right now. So we've got pro progressive web apps and we've got instant apps. So progressive web apps behave a little bit like native apps and instant apps behave a little bit like web. There's lower friction involved and it's about converting users to the right experience. Larger, larger device usage still has its own context because um, in recent research that we did with Neela, who's at the back, um, or in that team, um, we discovered that um, users of internet banking, for example, who own businesses still really like to experience the website on desktop browsers because they have high volume transactions to look at and high density, high effort um, tasks to, to complete when they're reconciling their taxes. And likewise, you might have gaming contexts and design, for example, or engineering where you need large screens, but they may not be reliant on the web. So the estimate is that there may be um, greater than 20 million um, connected Internet of Things devices um, over time. And if we think about web applications, there's quite a lot of sustainability in the way we code and how that's actually continued over the last 20 years into this new generation of Internet of Things and smart devices. So we still have persistent technology. We've got HTML, CSS and JavaScript. And we've got reliant back-end frameworks such as Python, Java, C++ and Ruby, which are the top four, but there's others. Um, so there's still a consistent behaviour in terms of how we actually build these things that we're designing for users. So if we come back to user experience design, and I don't know how much the audience knows about this, user experience design actually does have an international standards organisation definition. And it's defined as a person's perceptions and responses that result from the use or anticipated use of a product, system or service. So we could actually apply this to service design, um, something that Paul's specialising in, or we can apply this to different kinds of device contexts, such as omnichannel devices or new technologies such as virtual reality. But when we're thinking about these things, we're actually just thinking about people. And this is actually human-centred design, which is the parent category. So I won't read this out to you verbatim, but it's all about interactions, usability, ease of use, human factors, ergonomics, all of these things that make a better experience for people or anyone who uses a product, system or service. And if we go right back to 1986, we're thinking about Don Norman um, understanding as a designer or an engineering team, the mental models of the end user and how the system, in, system interface interacts with those users. And likewise, we have Peter Morville who came up with these models around context, content and users. And these are the three cycles of information architecture. And we also have the user experience honeycomb, which is all about value 
but there's a whole lot of facets to value, so they might be accessible, like Remy is going to talk about this evening, or credible, findable, usable, desirable, or useful. All of these things are important for user experience designers to investigate. And in, on top of that, we need to think about feasibility from a business sense and viability, feasibility from a technical sense, technology, so from an engineering sense, and also viability from a business sense. And how do we interact with our colleagues and our stakeholders and engage them in whatever we design and build? So as Nielsen says, don't be fooled by surface level design. And it's really easy when we get into these kind of fast paced, lean or agile environments to start thinking, okay, all we need to do is deliver. Um, user experience designers still need to do more than that and they need to do that with their teams, especially if they're in an agile workflow. So it is more than visual design. So when we talk about the user experience, it might be what the user perceives, but the visual design is simply not the only thing. And this is Jesse Jones Garrett's elements of user, user experience model, which has the layers of user experience from user needs right through to visual design. And I encourage you all to look at it. It's um, 2011 model now, but it's still frequently cited. And you could equate this to full stack engineering. You could say, okay, well, User experience designers need to cover all this stuff off, but engineering people also need to cover all these stuff, this stuff off over here. And there's some similarities because engineers might do a bit of UI and UX, and UXs might do a bit of engineering, although it's not covered in this model here. Um, so is that really a viable thing? Like if you have a team of one, sure, you might be building something on your own, and you might be highly effective at everything, but usually that happens later in career. So we have this concept called T-shapes. And you'll understand why I'm saying this later, but I'm just trying to build in a meaningful discussion before I get to it. So T-shaped people, it's an IDEO concept. Um, you can apply that to engineering or any functional capability. Um, usually somebody's deep in something or they might be shallow generally. And it's about maturity and time in industry and exposure to different things that they do. Um, also, we might have people who think that they can do everything, but the quality is low, so we have to be careful about that. And that's where Agile, Agile is really important because you get the whole team on a, on a thing together and you build in and compensate for each other. Where someone's strong, someone else might be strong, someone might be weaker, and you have to help the weaker team member and so forth. So you fill the gaps together. Um, so that brings me to Agile and Lean UX, and that will bring me to systems, I'll get there. Um, so it isn't this, because that's um, a hero model of anything. So if you're a unicorn, awesome, but in an Agile team, <laughs> that doesn't really work. Um, there's not really room for egos, and that will bring me again to the design system concept I'm going to talk about. So in order to do all the things, a good user experience requires it must be done as a team because there's no way a designer can do everything in a squad and still stay ahead and do all the execution. It's just too difficult and most of us have trouble with that unless they've got like the ideal scenario or context. And we can only try. It depends on how mature the team is and how they're flowing together. I've got to a point where I've done all the things but it's taken about a year. So it depends on who you're working with. Um, so cross-functional teams, and this is a scaling agile model from Spotify. This is all about different kinds of abilities and how you actually support each other so you can have chapters or guilds. Um, it's all about alignment as well. So teams are self-empowered, they're self-aligned, and they build things together. A designer might do a bit of engineering, an engineering might do a bit of design. But the whole point is to do the why and then doing the do and getting the feedback loop and being able to evolve forward as a team, which brings me to the need, of, need for speed that all the businesses have that we work with and the fact that we're trying to de deliver value to the customer and do the right thing. So if we're trying to do all the things but we're not supporting each other in teams, we can risk design being only this and the designer, to be, the designer could be told they do the UX and make things prettier and they might forget about accessibility or they might forget about um, inclusive design or they might forget about the fact that they need to look at the information architecture or do some testing, some look at findability and usability. 
There's all these other things that really affect a good software experience, and that includes the web. So if we automate design, which sounds like a demoralising concept for designers who might be highly trained, um, this is actually optimal, especially in technology environments, because it means that we can get to the point where we do the design thinking together. We start thinking about the lies and we problem solve. We start experimenting, so behaving like a lean team, and then we move into continuous improvement and delivery. We get the feedback in, and everybody's on the journey. So the designer isn't questioned. The designer is part of that collaboration model and everyone's aligned and doing it together, which is extremely powerful and fulfilling. So in becoming lean, which is complementary to agile, it can be done together, you need to find a way of reducing waste, which is why I'm talking about design automation and how it's important to UX to enable UX to occur. And that's in order to create a value creation in your organisation and get that pipe to the user. So here's an architectural model. It's actually based on an architectural article that was in a Berkeley blog. But I've included it because it's really quite interesting. You can apply it to software. Um, so the idea of having fewer drawings or fewer design artifacts can increase development. So it's, it seems a bit risky because you really want to articulate what you're designing. And it depends what stage you're at. If you're at an early stage, you might want to have an, a highly articulated visual designed to show the team what you might want to get to, say in a, a year or two. But you might also want to say, hey, we need to get there, but this might be a moving target. So we want to lower the effort and we want to increase the time in thinking and the time in alignment within the team. So that's why faster development and fewer drawings is great. And then living style guides, could be considered advanced tools because all of a sudden you've got patterns and you've got things to refer to and you've got communication vehicles that are in the production code. And it gives the team a greater capacity to be nimble. And so, for example, if a designer, if you have a single designer who's on holiday for a sprint, you can still go ahead and design something. It's not going to stop you. And the designer's okay with it because you've been through that process and protocol of validating your style guide. You have fewer parts, based on Nielsen's argument. Apps become more usable and you have higher recognisability, lower learnability in your app. And then if you have a simpler design process or system, it's easier to maintain and you lower system legacy. So by system legacy, I mean design legacy and technical legacy. So there's a whole lot of tools and I haven't included all of them because it's heaps. But um, in order of fidelity, um, there's a bunch of tools we could use to articulate design. I could start with drawing or whiteboarding right through to sketch, which a lot of people rely on as a bit of a crutch once you've got your system built, um, right through to Envision, Zeppelin, um, prototyping software such as Framer. I've got Storybook now, which is like a living style guide app that actually interacts with React and other kinds of frameworks. And we've got HTML. <coughs> CSS and JavaScript, which um, Storybook is built out of. And we've also got the production code right at the other end, which is the highest fidelity you can get to because that's what's, what's actually shipped to your customer or end user. So if you bring these together and reduce the things in between, you actually reduce the friction in your team somewhat because all of a sudden you can have lowered conversations about what the source of truth is and you can increase the conversation around what people are actually experiencing and how you can improve it and talk about the value of creating new things. So I've grouped the other things aside because they're still important. There's still use cases for them, um, such as high fidelity prototyping and high fidelity wireframing and so forth. But ideally, if you get to a place with a design system where you don't need them, it's kind of utopia. So it's everyone's responsibility, and I find a lot of design teams I work with find it really hard to argue the case for a design system in production code. Um, it's a huge pain point for a lot of teams I work with, and finding alignment's difficult. Um, and the goal is really to increase collaboration, um, improve team, team communication, and reduce waste. That's what it's about. So I've got a couple of scenarios, well, actually four, and they're very similar, but they're just I've just iterated on them. 
Um, so it's a little bit like an architectural schematic, but I've got people in it and I've got a bit of process included. So if you think about the designer creating an artefact for their team, so it could be an Envision file that's created out of Sketch, um, and there's a bunch of things that you can put in in Envision, but you could do it anyway. So just imagine it's Envision for this case, but it could be something else. Um, they pass it to an engineer who creates a modular package, which is a piece of code that um, is required to construct that feature, for example, to ship it out to the production app that goes out to the user. If you had a style guide app that is, that's externalised, and I've been in situations where there have been externalised style guide apps, they often require an externalised module that requires cloning. And this creates more effort in the engineering team, which leads to potentially out of sync style guides and in the end may not be maintained. So that's a problem for designers, especially if you get the things off the ground and you have the, the staff there to help you and your engineers are on board and everyone knows the importance of having that, that style guide and the fact that it's actually really valuable because then you can talk about what's actually in the app and all of a sudden it's out of sync. As well, we have this tension between the designer and the engineer because all of a sudden what is the source of truth? We've got, actually got two green things. Which of the sources of truth? We've got the module that goes to production. That's one source of truth. And then we've got the other source of truth, which is the communication tool. And often designers say, this is the source of truth. It's what I've designed. So if we go to the next one, we have an embedded style guide. But then we have two sources of truth still, which are embedded. So one great thing here is that you might have something that's generated from the same module, so you don't have two modules or two sets of production code that are sitting locally that you have to maintain. You've only got one, which is a great score, fantastic. But you do have this issue of two sources of truth that still creates tension. Um, a better scenario is if you go to the single source of truth, where the designer accepts that this is working software as a true Agile team member and realises that actually um, we can talk about this rather than talking about the artefact. And if the team members need higher definition, sure, they can provide that by giving them a higher definition artefact, but they could always draw something and put it in Envision or even just whiteboard it with their team. And in the end, they can still talk about the production app and what's in Storybook or a living style guide they've constructed bespokely. And then even better, apparently at Lassian do this, they have an externalised style guide app as well that's generated from the same module and production code. So um, these are the scenarios that I've seen and um, they have effects on teams as well as effects on design. So to become one, a bit like the Spice Girls, um, <laughs> it's also like bringing the brains together, you know, engineering and design, getting everyone to interact. So resolving the conflicting, conflicting sources of truth to one source of truth, but having a great communication tool or whatever brand it is, it doesn't really matter. It could be PowerPoint. Um, and then knowing that that's not a source of truth and not being too precious about it, but still anchoring yourself to good design and good behaviours and good communication. So you could use any technology for your app, and I've just used Storybooks as an example. I've actually just spoken to a front-ender in my team who said that they decommissioned Storybook because they felt that it was a bit limited and they wanted to adjust the repository. So it could be a custom build. Um, but currently Polymer, Vue and React are all complementary to Storybook and it's a great way to start to test the idea with your team. And thinking about how you behave as engineers, designers still get really concerned about the consistency of their artifacts with the production code. So they still want to make sure that their visual designs or interaction designs so they build it in various artefact creators like Sketch are actually consistent with that, what's out there in the wild. So you might want to build in um, engineering type protocols like committing um, to abstract, for example, which is an app that will let you version control your Sketch files or Envision's about to release one, I heard. So um, there's ways of having merge control even though they're binary files and actually um, committing changes and having a team on top of what's actually been changed and why through the commitment comments, just like an engineer would with any feature that they release or any code that they merge to master. So this is really small, I'm sorry about this, but here's some recommendations. Um, so steps to preparing for style-driven development and there's a really good article from Envato 
from a team member that I used to work with closely called Jordan Lewis. I really recommend you read it. Um, all about how you actually build a style guide and the story and process they went through. Um, and I was part of that team for quite some time. So I really think that it's a fantastic process and one of the most successful I've been involved in. So um, I would recommend that you conduct a view audit, um, audit your design patterns, audit your front end in parallel, look at the quality, agree a framework. So it could be atomic design, it could be something different. You could name it differently or adjust it to what you're building. Um, mirror the framework in your sketch files. Make sure that you have the same language across different protocols and disciplines so people know what they're talking about when they're talking about a component. Um, conduct a review of usability and also take the opportunity to upgrade your system accessibility and build in ARIA labels, that kind of thing. I'm sure that REM will go to town with this, so I won't go too far with that. Um, thinking about improvement, here's another long list. Slice improvement, so if you've, got, if you've got an existing system that's become like a spaghetti mess of code, um, try and slice it and just make it realistic. Get your front end team to really commit to upgrading and uplifting the technical architecture in the front end. Look at um, system improvements around microservices or decoupling concerns and um, make a case for improving the architecture to support your flow. Um, create a push-pull system between team members, make it collaborative. <coughs> Don't have a single owner. If you have a gatekeeper on the app, it makes it really difficult, especially if one's an engineer and the designers want to push through changes and they can't, or vice versa. If, it, if there's a designer who's a gatekeeper, it could be really difficult. So make sure you have a really even-handed management of the push-pull system. And um, include imperatives for usability and standards and accessibility. Um, so for designers, if you have design, if there are designers here, which I know there are a few, I'd advocate that you let it go, um, but embrace the new superpowers that you'll be allowed to have as a result of this. And be collaborative, pair with engineers, maintain rigor in organizing your style guide and keep it going, like form a guild or something, um, or a working group, um, increase lean behaviors, start sketching, really utilize the process, and um, use your artifact fidelities intelligently and be flexible. And finally, just remember the user. This is what it's about, delivering to the user and doing it quickly so you can get the feedback loop, do your research, do your testing. Um, because consistency is one of the most powerful usability um, principles, to quote Nielsen, and I'd, I'd agree with him. Um, and that's about it. Thank you.